Hello and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel for Friday the 11th of March. In case you haven't realized it yet, um, if you've been paying attention to the church calendar, um, and I recognize that some denominations and some members of the Christian churches don't necessarily observe Lent the way uh, the liturgical or churches like the Roman Catholic, the Anglican, or the Lutheran churches do. So we are smack dab now in the middle of Lent. Ash Wednesday began this season. It's 40 days followed by Holy Week and then um, the what's referred to in the Anglican Church as the Paschal Triduum. So I'm going to explain that a little bit. So it's 40 days from Ash Wednesday and leading up to Easter on April 17th. So from March 2nd or 3rd, March 3rd to April 17th. Now if you're doing your math, you're like, that's not 40 days, Rachel. I know. Um, we recognize Sundays as not part of Lent. They fall inside the, ter- the time of Lent, but we recognize them as days of, of breaking the fast. When we come together, we worship, we, we break bread together, we celebrate communion, and we remember always, of course, that Jesus died on the cross but was resurrected on Easter Day, and we celebrate who we are as Christians as a resurrected and saved people. Um, and so this season of Lent, there's Ash Wednesday and then um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday until Lent 1, the first Sunday in Lent, and then Monday through Saturday, and then 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and I believe it is Lent 5 that sometimes churches will, will celebrate Mothering Sunday. And I might be mistaken, but this is what I was taught, um, told, was that Mothering Sunday was this, this Sunday in, in the spring um, when the church would welcome all of all of its people home. So servants who worked in other people's houses um, in England would be given that Sunday to be able to go home to their mothers and go to church with them, have the day, a day off, and go back to their mother church. Um, so quite often, the cathedrals would be filled, or people would go home to visit with their mothers, and so hence we have Mothering Sunday. It's also a day when we we really do actually break the fast. So if you've given up something sweet or something for 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 Lent, then quite often people will have um, will have a, a feast that day. And in a church that I was involved in in um, in Halifax at St James, our Mother's Union always prepared simnel cake. And if you like sweet things, this is the cake for you. It was heavy. The first year they brought it forward and we would bless it at the altar with the bless, with all the gifts that were brought forward, the bread and the wine and the donations made to the church, the alms and the the bread, these cakes were brought forward. And I was thinking, oh, it's a cake until uh, the person put it in my hands. And it was like, it's a cake. (laughs) It's, It's really, really dense and very, very heavy. Um, but it's a beautiful symbol of, of all of those things, of being able to break the fast and celebrate and have that bit of, bit of sweet, very a lot of sweet at that moment. So simnel cake is something that, that happens sometimes in churches when we have um, this gathering for Mothering Sunday. In some, t- in some cases, that is considered the Mother's Day. Um, so I believe in England, that is Mother's Day. So we celebrate mothers that day. Uh, in Canada, of course, we wait until May and we celebrate Mother's Day then. So Lent, and after that, we have Lent 5. And then we have the next Sunday is has often been known as Palm Sunday, in which we come into the church and we, we think about and we pray about, we hear the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey with palm branches on the ground and people welcoming him the way they would welcome a king people celebrating and singing hosannas, that Jesus is coming. And then we move into, now a lot of, there are some churches I know that 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 Palm Sunday is their celebration and then they have Easter next Sunday, but they they miss the chunk in the middle. I remember, um, and it's really important, I want to talk to you about that, why it's important not to miss the chunk in the middle and why I I do things differently than that. Um, And why I'm finding lots and lots of Anglican churches in particular are moving away from simply doing that. Um, My first parish, I was in a two-point parish in one of the churches. um, The hymns were chosen. Um, I chose the hymns. And I sent them off to the bulletin. And and we had um, a very strong person, very strong personality who was in the choir in the the congregation. And she she called up the person who would do my, my, my bulletins for me and said, we're, we're going to change up the, 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 the hymns. We're going to do these two hymns, the last two hymns, 
she's got listed. We're going to do those first, and we're going to do the first two hymns listed last. Okay. So I got to church, and the organist was playing, and never occurred to me that somebody would change what I had asked that we would do. And we walked in to go to Dark Gethsemane, and our gradual hymn was, Oh, um, oh, or sore wounded. Um, it, either way, it's, I can't remember the exact title, but it's very, very heavy, very Lenten, very Good Friday-ish hymn. And then we had our offertory hymn was Ride On, Ride On, Ride On Hosanna, and our dismissal hymn, our recessional hymn, was um, another Hosanna hymn, like the coming into Jerusalem with the palm crosses kind of hymn. And the problem was, is that there was a reason why the hymns were chosen where they are, because in the Anglican tradition, in our prayer book, in the Book of Alternative Services, we have we have the Passion Sunday liturgy with the liturgy of the palms. So we come in in great triumph. We come in waving our palm crosses or our palm palm branches, singing right on, right on in majesty or some other hymn that's beautiful and upbeat and celebratory and recognizing Jesus entering Jerusalem as as a almost as a conquering hero, as this recognition of who he is, who for us, who he is going to be before the story is complete. And we come into that and we have, a, we, a, we stop and we have the gospel about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we continue with a prayer and then we move on. And as we move into our liturgy then, we listen to the Old and New Testament and then we listen to the passion narrative. And now if you're not used, if you're not, if you don't know what a passion narrative is, it's not a passionate narrative. It's not about, you know, some wonderful romance or something. It's a passion, the passion of Christ. So we tell the story of what happened on Monday Thursday when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and he and he broke the bread and said, one of you will betray me. And Judas goes off and betrays him. And then he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and asks the disciples if they could not wait awake, stay awake with him for a few hours and they fall asleep. And then Judas comes back with the soldiers and they take him and he's tried, uh, has a trial. And then the next day, the morning on Saturday, he goes off to Pontius Pilate and he is presented to Pilate. And he says, basically, I wash my hands of this is yours if you want to do do with him what you will. And the Jewish people yell, crucify him. And then, or this is on Friday morning, sorry, not Saturday. Then they go off and they walk to the, where they walk to Golgotha, the hill um, of the, the skull, the, 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 the place of the skull. And they crucify Jesus on timbers, on wooden beams. And then the sky darkens. And then we hear that story on Passion Sunday. And then we move into the Eucharist, which takes on a different feel when that is the story you've just heard the story of the crucifixion and then we leave we say some prayers and we leave the service to something like go to dark gethsemane or some other very very good friday like him because we are being invited to live a holy holy week quite often i'm not sure what we'll do here this week this year but quite often i've always had a service of eucharist Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week. Just a quiet service. You come in, the church is draped in red. Um, it's the colors of passion. And then Monday, Thursday, we come together and the church is in white. We're about to celebrate the institution of the Lord's Supper. So we gather. But before we do that, there is an opportunity for the members of the congregation to have their foot washed. Now, this is just a symbolic foot washing. So it's not like take both your socks off and your shoes and I'm going to scrub your feet with soap. This is a symbolic foot washing. It allows me as priest to remember that I am a servant and I kneel before the members of the congregation, those who will allow me the, the honor of doing so, to symbolically wash their foot. And when I do so, when I do that, I pour warm water over their foot as they place their foot in a basin, their bare foot, and then I, I put the water up over their, their feet and I wash, symbolically wash away the dirt. You know, remember that people would have their feet washed when they came into a house in Jesus' time because they would be walking on, on sandy dirt roads wearing sandals, so their feet would be filthy. And this was an opportunity to feel refreshed and cleansed. And so I, I symbolically wash the foot. And then I always take the time 
to with the water to to make the sign of the cross on the top of a person's foot and then I just hold their foot and I say a prayer for them a prayer for peace a prayer for hope a prayer for healing whatever whatever the spirit places on my heart I say a silent prayer and then I dry off their foot and they move on and I receive the next person it is a humbling act for me to do and I believe it is humbling for the person receiving it as well our feet are such things that we keep so private we're so embarrassed by our feet but this that makes it all that much more powerful to do this after that is done we we move on to having the Eucharist and we we remember that first time when Jesus sat around the table with his disciples and he broke the bread and he gave them the wine and we it, we we celebrate the institution of the Lord's Supper following that within the set of the liturgy we take some of the bread and the wine that has been consecrated and we re, we keep it we set it aside and put candles with it so that it might stay safe through the night and then we strip the church we take the linens off the altar all of the color from the church is gone until the whole church is bare and the only thing left is the bread and the wine consecrated sitting with candles on the bare wood altar and we leave the church the, ser the service is not ended. The liturgy has not been completed. We leave the church in silence because we will continue the liturgy on Friday as we come together and we hear the passion narrative and we listen, we sing the deep, the deep were you there when they crucified the Lord, those kinds of hymns. And we receive the reserved sacrament. So people are invited to come forward to receive the body and blood of Christ that have been consecrated the night before. And when we receive that sacrament, for some people, they oh, it's not right to do it on Good Friday. But I must ask the question, is it not exactly right to do it on Good Friday? To receive the body and blood, which we have just remembered, was broken and shed for us. There's no pomp and circumstance. We simply say the Lord's Prayer and receive the body and blood of Christ. And then we say a prayer and we leave the church again. The service has not ended. We are just quietly leaving the church in the dark with the candle candles that were around the sacrament are burnt out because the sacrament is now has now gone and we leave the church in the dark but we come back on Saturday night for the Easter vigil this three days the Monday Thursday Good Friday and an Easter vigil that's called the Paschal Triduum the three days of the Pasch of the Pascha the Pascha the the Passover that is Jesus Christ receiving receiving upon upon him the sins that we have committed that he might break the bonds of our sins and give us this beautiful gift of eternal life we come back to the church on saturday night to complete the three-day liturgy we gather outside and we light the fire the new fire that then in turn lights the christ candle and then everybody's candle is lit everybody's taper is lit from that christ candle and we say the peace of christ as we watch the light grow as every candle is lit and then we move this year we'll move into the hall at St. Thomas and we will will gather there together in the dark and we will hear the story of creation and the story of God working through the prophets and through the our ancestors through the patriarchs and the matriarchs of the church as we work our way through the Old Testament until when we're ready to receive the good news the good news of what has come out of out of Good Friday when we go into the church, we throw open the doors, the lights are on, the candles are lit, and we are able to sing our alleluias, and we listen to the good news, the gospel, telling us that Jesus is no longer bound in that tomb, but he has broken the bonds of death for himself and for everyone, and is now with us in a new way as we celebrate the resurrected Lord. And we have the communion, we celebrate Eucharist, and we are happy and joyful. And then we then our service is over. Then we have our dismissal. And we come back on Easter Day and all the kids and Easter bunnies and all the, the chocolate and everybody's all jacked up on sugar. And we celebrate with joy and, and hope this incredible gift God has given us. But understanding the power of Easter Day takes walking through a holy Lent. We are called to walk through a holy Lent. And so I invite you 
to join me on this Holy Lent. And when the time comes to go to, come to my churches or go to another church, but participate somehow in Pas Palms, Passion Sunday with the Liturgy of the Palms, in Holy Week, in Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and the, whole, and the Easter Vigil on, Good, on Holy Saturday. So that when you get to Easter Day, you will truly understand what depths Jesus went to to rise you up into new life. That's my, my Lenten invitation to you. And I hope you will join me or find a place where you can join others because it truly is not a journey you can take alone. You, we need to be with others when we do this Lenten journey into Holy Week, the Paschal Triduum, and then Easter Day. Have a good day. God bless you. Have a good weekend. I will be here again on Sunday for our mini worship for Lent 2, the second Sunday in Lent, um, and back again, of course, on Monday for Church at Home with Rachel. God bless you. Have a blessed weekend.